Welcome to the ongoing webinar uh, series, uh, which uh, CFA Society India has uh, initiated on account of the lockdown, uh, which we are all currently experiencing. Um, today, we have an interesting topic in terms of practitioners' insights on manager selection. Um, I'm sure a lot of us uh, must be advising the clients. A uh, lot of us must be uh, tracking the investment advisory process and uh, even otherwise interested in uh, very, very uh, uh, I have the privilege of moderating this session today. Uh, uh, and we have a, a speaker uh, with a unique profile himself uh, with experience of uh, managing uh, uh, process of manager selection as, a, as, a, as an investment advisor heading the desk. And also uh, today, in an independent uh, as, a, as a third party practitioner, uh, his current role as director at Morningstar, Kaustub uh, Belapur, a fellow CFA charter holder, BGDM from IM Kolkata, and BTEC from ECT. Some of the key take takeaways that we can look from today's session is to decipher fund manager investment styles and can pass performance to be relied upon the select funds, understanding performance attribution and factor profiles. Besides this, I am sure uh, Kaustub will bring us various practices, various criteria, various attributes, quantitatively and qualitatively. Um, one would look at the manager selection process. Uh, I'm sure uh, a lot of you must be uh, frequent flyers with us. Um, I mean, it is Travel. I'm saying a lot of you must be frequent audience with us going through this sessions every day. But uh, to quickly give an overview of the flow of today's uh, session, uh, it's going to be a one hour session uh, with 30 minutes presentation from Costco and 30 minutes to a day. Um, we can extend the session by another 15 minutes or so, depending on the flow. Uh, all participants are requested to use the QA uh, provision which is available ask relevant questions. Uh, they shall be curated and uh, taken up. Uh, the will be shared in the chat. Uh, will be shared five minutes before the end of the session. Uh, and uh, if feedback is valuable, please take the survey. Link is shared on the confirmation mail. And also will be shared in the chat at the end of the session. The thank you mail. So uh, welcome, Kostub, and thanks for uh, joining us. Uh, one of the things that has uh, so in my earlier uh, first half of my career as a wealth manager and even later on, one of the slides which caught my rapt attention and uh, also been a central theme of my many conversations uh, was that pie chart uh, where it was mentioned that 91% or 91 plus percent was of the returns are determined or performance is determined by the asset allocation. And rest is maybe security selection and uh, other timing of the market and other factors. Uh, one of the uh, which is the different thing that how much of asset allocation itself has been understood and practice advice to the clients, but not apart. The whole process of manager selection itself uh, was kind of, uh, I believe, should they have been given more weightage than looking at morning starts and value research top 10, 15 performing funds and uh, as if they don't matter. My conversation with you yesterday, for example, last one week rather, has been, uh, it's been eye-opening in terms of the data that you gave as to how the fund manager uh, and funds have performed, not necessarily as a reflection of the broader asset class performance or the market performance, but there are not many attributes. So we are really right. looking forward for this session to hear from you, uh, from your vast experience uh, on uh, what are the fund best manager uh, selection practices. And, uh, you know, so. Over to you. Sure. So, uh, firstly, uh, you know, thanks, Kalyan. Uh, thank you so much for the kind introduction. And uh, good evening to all the uh, attendees of the webinar. And, uh, you know, thank you for taking out the time. I know these are uh, interesting, difficult times. Everyone's under lockdown, but, you know, I think. It's useful to share thought processes, kind of cross-pollinate ideas, and uh, you know, I really thank the CFA India Society to uh, kind of give me the opportunity to talk about it. Uh, like Kalyan said, the context about really, uh, you know, asset allocation always forms one of the core practices in terms of 
constructing efficient portfolios and there's no taking away the fact that it is the building block of an efficient portfolio construction mechanism uh, but what often you know does kind of you know either get ignored or not really be paid too much focus on is the manager selection or the fund selection within that because you know to my mind uh, both of these kind of go hand in hand because at times and you know we talk about it in the you know sort of through the presentation that what happens at times is uh, the investor gets into a fund he might have an asset allocation in mind but actually looks at performance and gets in to it and his asset allocation could go all right or his behavioral sort of factors come into play because he's gone into a fund without actually understanding the context of the fund and that's really what we want to address through uh, the next 25 30 minutes really talking about how can you select funds and understand the mandates of those funds right so let's just get down to uh, you know talking about really how do we go about doing that before that uh, what i want to do is this um so what you have seen typically you know some of the typical investor behavior and this is not just in india but globally is that there are very typical behavioral biases that come along with investor behavior there's obviously the recency bias you know anything that's done well recently becomes the top pick or the best idea to invest into herd mentality if someone else or the street is buying it then you know i should not miss out you know fomo is they refer to it so the really some these biases come into a big way and then what ends up happening is recent performance of funds becomes a very important selection criteria for investors when they're trying to pick funds now we want to you know just talk through is that really the true mechanism for selecting a fund without understanding the context within which those that performance was generated right if you look at uh, you know there've been studies done globally in terms of investor returns and what what that's shown is because of these behavioral biases on an average an average investor on the street is actually made on anywhere between half a percent to almost 1.25% lower than the fund returns that's because you know they've they've kind of chased performance in a fund or exit too soon these kind of behavioral biases have actually impacted their performance and that kind of leads into or leads into the asset allocation uh, philosophy that we follow so manager selection becomes very very important in terms of not just picking the right managers but sticking with them and also kind of you know uh, making sure that uh, you know you don't get into the wrong fund to start with right in fact we did a very quick dip study of seeing how flows have been from an indian context uh, and i i am not allow uh, you know surprised with the data when i looked at it that almost 80% of the flows if i just link it back to the quartile 1 and quartile 2 performance on a one year basis 80% of the money actually entered into equity funds into a q1 or a q2 fund uh, based on one year performance now that's a little bit uh, you know which is interesting and i would say a little alarming and you know that's something we want to kind of address through the rest of the presentation that what are some of the other tools practices that we can use to you know de-jump that performance is is key i mean performance is obviously important but it needs to be looked in the context of many other things rather than just a pure number of performance right and that's really the question we pose can we solely rely on fund performance right now we did a study and this is a very interesting global study that was done and we replicated the same for india is the study is you know, very simply named is there a good time to buy or sell an actively managed fund now, what the study tried to do was uh, you know you had a universe of funds uh, and you try to break it down into monthly returns of funds over the last 10 years that means 10 years that's 120 data points and you calculate the excess return of the fund versus its benchmark on a month on month basis and you simply just put them in a descending order so the best excess return month on top and the worst at the bottom and then one by one you start knocking off you know the best performing months for that period and you come to a number where the fund's performance you know excess returns have actually gone to negative that means the fund is underperforming the benchmark so simply put when you look at it from an indian context 8 months out of 120 which is 6.7% of the entire data period accounted for the outperformance of a fund versus its benchmark and in fact for that matter equities over cash so that you know that drives on the point that fund performance you know the outperformance that we talk about can come in spurts and that's a function of the market cycle uh, but if you identify a good manager you need to stick with them rather than you know try to keep switching between funds because recent performance of a fund if it looks good that means maybe the good months for that fund might have already passed or the bulk of that outperformance may have come and you know it's very important from the context of what we're seeing in the market right now right we've seen that very narrow band of the market really move up significantly and that's that's impacted a lot of managers who have not been over allocated to that sort of strategy but managers who who stuck to that style have has already paid off for them right now 
but you know when the market cycle may turn i don't know but you know obviously when it does investors who looked at past performance and came in could you know potentially actually be in for a uh, you know sort of surprise when they start seeing funds tracking the benchmark more closely right so if i just uh, you know use that example of uh, a fund which has done exceedingly well and you know we'll talk about uh, a little more about the fund later in the presentation what's important to highlight is the kind of flows this fund has seen and you know we we kind of alluded to it earlier um, this is a large cap strategy and if you look at the focus of the fund has clearly been towards a large growth quality stocks and that's something they've been following to the t for many many years right it's not like it's happened overnight it's a process they've been diligently following and we'll talk a little bit more about the process a little later on the presentation but what the interesting bit is in 2015 and 16 if you know if you just look at the calendar year performances of the fund and versus the benchmark and the peer group clearly this fund was underperforming uh despite the fact that they you know they've been following the same strategy since you know along before that but because the market cycle was not in the favor of their style it wasn't really doing well and that's when it wasn't being noticed by investors investors weren't really putting in money into it but the moment that needle turned and their style really started moving in the market uh you know you can see the performance has really tracked well obviously and and I'm kudos to them for that but the uh, you know the returns uh, or rather the flows in the funds have really been significantly high since then and again you know going back to my earlier example about the critical months now if a large part of the performance because of the market cycles already been kind of you know i mean the outperformance the significant outperformance that's come into the fund has already happened the investor comes in today looking purely at the performance without understanding why that performance was delivered uh it could be a double whammy because you know they might have missed the bus so to speak and secondly you know if the fund obviously when the market cycle turns starts cracking closer to the peer group and the benchmark uh investors could start thinking that hey what happened is this suddenly you know has it become a bad fund overnight and you know that's what we'll talk about but just you know just something to leave you to chew upon is they've been actually following a very consistent framework so from that perspective they've done a great job like i said 15 16 the cycle didn't work for them that didn't deter them they stuck to their guns they stuck to the focus that they really have in terms of their investment mandate right now it's paid off significantly for them uh but you know uh, over a market market cycle as long as they stick to their style they'll do well but the point is uh in, in over the short term when the market cycle turns it could potentially go against them and that's something we need to be educating ourselves to investors that you know that will happen markets go through cycles styles go through cycles and that's why it's very important to look beyond performance right now another very very extreme example but i think it's very important to highlight this is a fund and this is back to you know before the gfc days in 2007 i don't know how many of you all uh, were actually in the market then but this is a fund that blew everyone out of the water right uh, it delivered about 110% returns um versus you know the other benchmarks be about 60 65% so almost you know uh, almost close to double the uh, the fund performance uh, of the other right and if you look at the flows data below you can clearly see again flows were tracking the great performance so money was coming in as that fund was delivering exceptional performance so that and and you know really outsized performance right but we know if you look at the chart above and you see that yellow line has really dropped off the cliff post that uh which clearly and we'll explain very shortly why that's happened but you can see that investors who did not understand and invested in that fund were hit dramatically because they obviously missed capturing a large part of that upside and participated in the downside to a significant extent and you know to my earlier point about asset allocation if there was a guy who was coming to equities for the first time picked this fund he would have probably not touched the equities as an asset class for the next 5 years despite the fact that you know on a broader sense it would have done really well right and why did this happen and you know what are some of the things that you could have looked at to see that is this the fund that i really want to invest in or is this something that i want to get investors into uh, uh this is something i'm sure all you know we all cfa are the charter holders or member you know sort of uh, people who are appearing for the exams we've spoken about portfolio performance attribution now this is a two factor attribution uh, model you know with interaction and selection what this shows me uh, and i'm now going to get into the semantics of how it's calculated i'm sure uh, you know all of us will be aware of that but one thing which really stands out and the one we kind of highlighted and read is that lumpy performance coming in through purely significant holdings into a sector uh, you know sort of segment of the market which is industrials in this case that it did exceedingly well during that time now it would be foolhardy to think that a manager uh, could have potentially you know uh, you know it is obviously momentum carrying these stocks at that point of time but he, you know he can kind of repeat this performance year in year out Uh, and you know, if I just slice and dice this performance or the portfolio further, 
are these two charts. Now, these are super busy charts, but if you look at it, uh, one is obviously the allocation across uh, capitalizations and style, you know, growth value print. And the bottom chart is, uh, you know, uh, exposure to sectors for the fund, right? The one thing I can consistently sort of see is that there's been significant changes, sweeping changes in the portfolio. Uh, so it's not following, a, you know, necessarily one particular construction mandate for the fund, rather it's kind of been, uh, you know, chasing momentum. And that's something which, you know, obviously we need to be wary of and we're looking at uh, picking strategies. So like we spoke about, performance is one thing, but it needs to be looked at in the context of the investment mandate and the way has it been consistently applied or not, right? Now we'll move on to uh, really, you know, what we talked about uh, the manager selection techniques and, you know, what are some of the things that we can potentially look at, right? So we spoke about quantitative analysis, you know, historical performance has remained the most common fund evaluation method. So that, as we've spoken about in the last 10 minutes, that it doesn't really work efficiently. What could you do to pick funds? Now, I know it's a tough job because, you know, we have an industry that's growing and, you know, you see new fund launches, uh, they're almost close to 1,000 plus funds, the 40 plus SM managers, uh, there are various categories that the regulators created. The one thing you can start with, and we always talk that as a short list strategy for funds, is the quantitative rating frameworks. Now, you could use your own rating framework. Uh, Morningstar themselves has a very interesting rating framework that I'll talk about very shortly uh, in terms of quantitative ratings for funds. You could use that as a short listing tool, but that shouldn't be your end point for making a decision. What you should do after that is actually a lot of qualitative analysis, and that's what we really practice at Monista in terms of you know a few things that you know I'll, I'll talk about is in terms of evaluating the people and process driving the strategy. I think that's that's key, right? So we spoke a little bit about alluding to the process that or investment mandate of the fund. We talk about the people who are managing it, you know. So uh, that's that's very important. Studying fund manager styles, have they been kind of you know really religiously following that, or is that and you know do we, do we think it can be repeatable or not? The performance attribution that we spoke about was that skill or luck, you know, because that can performance attribution can really be an eye opener in telling you uh, several things about a strategy. Is that in line with the mandate, or is that something that's unexplainable? And obviously, the last thing you want to do is when you're, uh, you know, in terms of building a portfolio, uh, when you're talking about manual selection, you want to pack that up with different styles. Because when we spoke about that, you know, different styles working different market cycles, uh, you know, growth's working right now, uh, value could work at some point of time. So you want to pack that up with different, different managers that you can identify through this process. Right? So I think that becomes very important. Uh, just very quickly talk about the rating, uh, sort of quantitative rating frameworks that we have. So one is obviously the star ratings, uh, you know, which is the quantitative backward rating. And the second one is the analyst ratings. And I'll talk about the elements of each of these, right? So when we talk about risk, the most standard definition of risk uh, would always be, uh, you know, standard deviation. Uh, but the biggest problem of standard deviation is a, you know, we assume that there's a normal distribution and we know that's not really how returns typically get distributed. And B, investors hate negative sort of, uh, you know, uh, um, variation. They don't mind a positive variation as long as you're not paying excessive risk for that. So that's what the Morningstar Risk Adjusted uh, Returns do, where it uses a function called the expected utility function for investors, where, uh, you know, it's basically a positive sloping curve, but there's a very sharp drop off on the negative return side. That means any Negative return will get penalized very heavily. A negative deviation will get penalized very heavily. Uh, and, you know, there's a decreasing marginal utility for uh, extra uh, unit of positive returns because obviously you don't want to be taking on additional risk to, uh, you know, generate extra return. So when I put that in the context of just comparing two funds and uh, it's a very quick graphical example. If you look at the two funds the, uh, on the chart here, right? So there's fund A in the blue dot and fund B in the green dot. Uh, on the ace axis is the five-year performance. You can clearly see that Five-year performance stands for, uh, you know, fund B is done better than fund A, uh, albeit marginally. But when I compare it to the five-year risk-adjusted returns, fund A actually stacks up better than fund A. And why is that? The next data will show us very clearly. When you can look at the variation of the returns, fund A has been a lot less volatile than fund B. Fund B has been all over the place. And I think that's very important to acknowledge because investors will come at different points of time. The more volatile your strategy, uh, you know, it will become obviously more riskier, and especially with large downsides, uh, that becomes, you know, something that we will incorporate into MRER, and, uh, you know, that's why Fund B actually uh, ranks poorer than Fund A. Now, like I said at the start, that, you know, this is the basis of our star ratings, uh, and it's only a starting point. So if you want to use that as a tool to filter out funds, you know, 
add new funds to your filter, the ones that have been doing well. And obviously these are based on long-term risk adjusted returns, not the more recent performance, three, five, 10 years. That gives you an element of predictability in a sense. Uh, but again, it has to be padded with, uh, you know, a uh, look at, uh, you know, the, the qualitative aspects. And I'll just, uh, you know, move to that bit about what are the qualitative aspects that we can look at some of the things that we do, right? So one is, uh, so Morningstar follows this philosophy, which is called the three pillar process. It used to be the five pillar, and I'll talk about the other two uh, very shortly, but the three important pillars, the qualitative assessment of a fund or its strategy. is obviously the people in terms of, you know, who's the manager, but it doesn't, the buck doesn't stop at the manager because he's ably supported by a team of analysts, economists, uh, you know, the research guys, even, even sort of quant analysts these days. So I think that's something we need to get a pulse on in terms of really what the skill set of the team is, what's the depth, uh, you know, what's the bandwidth? I think that's another important thing that often gets missed. Uh, if a manager is managing too many sort of funds, is that, is, is that creating a problem and him actually spending enough time, productive time on each strategy? Uh, the second bit is obviously the process and that really becomes the core of our discussion in terms of you know, how the idea generation happening, what is the basic investment mandate of the fund? Because that's that's really the core. You know, is he a more of a value sort of manager? Is he a growth or a reasonable price manager? Is he a growth out and out growth manager like we saw with the Axis Blue Chip Fund? What's his, so, you know, where, where is his valuation discipline lie? What are some of the risk management tools? So these are the conversations that the team would actually have with the managers in terms of assessing. And it's, uh, you know, because we have access to so much data and I'll show you some of the charts that we look at, uh, we can actually draw a lot of meaningful conclusions in terms of what managers are saying and what they're doing, are they in sync or not? And, you know, we keep meeting managers, so, you know, we can always check back the conversations we had with them two, three years back, which gives us a sense of that, you know, are they really following or towing the line in terms of what they're saying? And obviously the last one, which is a very interesting thing is, uh, you know, I'll just quickly talk about it, that is the, is the parent, uh, which is the asset manager and various stewardship policies they have in terms of manager compensation and, and things of like that. But a large part of the focus would be towards the people and the process side. And the last bit, like we've spoken about, you know, performance, uh, which is another thing that we used to pick uh, now that it gets rolled up into the first three pillars. That's more of a check that is the performance in line with the mandate of the fund. So that means even if the fund is performing really well or poorly right now, is that in line or an expected lines with the way the fund's being managed or the state and mandate of the fund? So if a value fund is doing well in a growth driven market, that's a little bit of a concern, right? Because you would expect a value fund to underperform during those markets as we've seen with the value managers. But if that starts happening, if a value manager starts deviating from a style and chasing growth, that's that's a bigger concern than someone who's actually not doing well in a growth market, that's, that's actually understandable. And the last one, obviously being price, you know, because on a relative context and more importantly on the fixed income side of things, uh, price can play an important role, uh, you know, uh, swing between different strategies. So I want to share a couple of really relevant live examples. We did that through a few examples earlier, but I'll just talk about a few more, which will actually give you context as to how we can look at it. Right? Uh, so good fund performance, but are there other risks uh, sort of uh, looking there. Now, this is is a fund, uh, and you know these are these are examples that we're using, so that kind of drives home the point. Not necessarily funds that we like or dislike. It was just to kind of elaborate or sort of drive home the point. But if you look at the IDFC Multicap, which is erstwhile known as the IDFC Premier Equity Fund, uh, really well managed fund uh, by Kenneth, uh, you know, Andrade, who had been managing it for a long time, and his style is you know, looking at those uh, really high growth companies within that mid and small cap space uh, and you know from niche sectors niche uprising sort of uh, you know upcoming sectors and he was doing an excellent job of that the other thing that we must commend that they were doing was that they were gating the flows on the fund when they thought the capacity was become a constraint that's something that we really appreciate because you don't want fund size to balloon beyond a point that the uh, you know the investment style gets diluted so they were doing that really well but the biggest challenge you know at that point of time that we saw uh, and, you know, I've kind of highlighted that uh, circle in blue in 2015 when Kenneth left. So obviously we kind of been bringing that up as a key man risk. That the process was largely, you know, kind of driven by, by Kenneth uh, in terms of, because it was something which was very, very central to him, but not necessarily ingrained within the entire team. So that was a little bit of, uh, you know, concern that we saw. Otherwise, obviously it was a pretty well-managed fund, but it was linked to Kenneth being with the strategy, right? Obviously Kenneth moved on. And, uh, you know, before the time, Anup, that Anup Bhaskar, who's now managing the fund, another great manager, took on the reins. There was that vacuum that was created. Uh, and uh, clearly that, you know, fund in 16, 17 went through some really trying times, as you can see, against the benchmark that, you know, it was more of a mid-cap uh, sort of focus fund at that point in time. Uh, 
And after that, obviously, it's gone through changes because Anu brings in a slightly different style, and you can see it's become more multi, more multi cap fund after the categorization. So clearly, you know, even a fund's done well uh, from the context of things. If there's a key man risk that needs to be understood and called out, and you know, if when you when you do a conversation, you understand the people, the process that can really highlight some of these risks that come right. Uh, another one, uh, and this is more interesting on the other side of things. Right? A good manager, a well-managed process, but recent performance doesn't stack up. Uh, so this is another sort of uh, you know fund which is uh, one of the, you know probably a very well-known name, Bashan Jain on the HDFC top 100. Now if you look at it, uh, you know sort of 19, 20, or you know have been really bad years uh, for the fund. Uh, you know the ones that I've highlighted in terms of both against the benchmark the peer group. Uh, but clearly, if I look at the chart below, that's one thing we have to acknowledge and we spoke about understanding the framework, right? So Prashant's always followed that value contrarian style of investing, and that's clearly visible within his allocation into the large blend and large value sort of segment of the market, the blue and the light blue part of the segment. Uh, and you can see that he's been following that quite religiously as compared to you know, a lot of the other managers who have been more GAAP or growth oriented. Uh, in, the, in their approach. And we all know what's happened in the market, right? 2019, uh, you know, late 2018, 19, even now, quality growth has really paid off and values really dragged on. In fact, it's not just a local phenomena, even globally that's happened. So it's understandable, right? And when we look at the performance attribution, and I'll actually move on to the attribution, the style attribution, which is a more interesting way of looking at it. Uh, what you can see is the large growth where he's been significantly underweight. And what has actually hampered his performance because uh, you know that's not really work, right? Large value has been overweight and value has not worked. So the active return looks bad, uh, but that's purely because of the fact that you know he's followed a strategy that he's he's really stuck his guns to. Now, when value does come back in favor, this fund could move back. But you know, for the moment, uh, investors are not really gung ho about this fund because the recent performance is not that great. So the point that I'm making is that there are funds that have done well, but you need to understand the context from where they've done well. At the same time, their funds been run with great processes, managers following into the team, haven't recently done well, doesn't mean that they're bad funds, right? So you need to kind of get down to evaluating a lot of these aspects. Uh, and when you look at data, it can actually tell you a lot. Uh, you know, this is just another attribution chart, which tells you, uh, so when you're having conversations with the manager, uh, or you know, you're having conversations uh, with your clients, when you look at things, a lot of these things are explainable, right? So when we, you know, when we were speaking to Prashant, uh, we know that he had significant calls on you know, going underweight certain sectors, which have worked for him. So it's not like the process is not working for him. It's just that the market cycle has been against him at this point of time, right? Now, the last one, uh, you know, in terms of standout performance, skill or luck, right? So we spoke about this earlier, the access blue chip. And that's, that's the move point that I was making that 15, 16, he's not changed the strategy. He's been running this for a while. It didn't work in 15, 16 for him, but now's the time that, you know, it's really, paid great benefits for him to stick to his style. It's been, he's been consistent, uh, which is great. But you know, circling back to uh, the critical months uh, study that we said, when the cycle turns, investors need to understand and be very, very cognizant of the fact that this sort of outperformance can potentially not repeat because uh, you know, you're know you not going to have blowout performance. I mean, maybe it could continue for a, for a little longer given what we've seen around uh, you know the whole uh, market, uh, obviously with the coronavirus and things. But, it's not like you know it's going to just continue for for decades or whatever. So I think that's very important to articulate that you need to kind of put performance in the context of things and set your expectations right. So it's a great fund because it's stuck to the style, but you need to stay invested through. Uh, so you know people who've invested in 2018-19 shouldn't be demoralized. Uh, demoralized, you know, if uh, the performance doesn't really stack up, say in the next year or two. Uh, but over a market cycle, as long as the manager is obviously sticking to his guns, uh, the fund should do well because it's a consistent sort of investment framework, right? Now, in the interest of time, I'm just going to quickly sort of, uh, you know, sort of wrap up over the next three, four minutes. Uh, but there are interesting charts uh, that, you know, we can look at to see how consistently. So we spoke about, uh, you know, the earlier charts that I shared. Now, this is something what we call the factor profile of funds. And we're going to be actually going live with this for Indian data soon, but you know, I'm just giving an early access to it is the same for the access fund, right? So we spoke about consistency. Look at the style chart in terms of growth and value. One thing you can do is obviously compare where the fund lies right now, which is the blue sort of uh, big dot. You can see he's more growth oriented, which we, like we discussed. The blue, uh, the black small dot is actually where the category is, right? The category average. So you can see he's, he's 
he's got a higher growth orientation than the Caribbean. And the blue shaded part is actually a uh, sort of, you know, range within which he's moved. So you can see it's a narrow range. He's largely stuck to the growth style of investing, which, and this is over the last five years, so which tells you that he's been consistent. And this is a very quick look, easy chart for you to access and make a decision that, okay, a manager has actually been doing what he's meant to do. And he's stuck to that, right? The last bit to the uh, thing before I actually hand it back to uh, Kalyan for Q&A is we spoke about different manager styles. How can you pad that up into a portfolio of funds, right? Now, I've, I've used examples of, uh, you know, we're all aware of what the style box is, which, you know, gives you a very interesting example. And I've just picked four funds. We spoke about two of them. But you can see the rating styles that come. So HDFC Top 100, we already said, is more of a value bias fund. But when you look at the bill of frontline equity, he's more of a GOP style manager. You can see he's got significant allocation both to the blend and the growth style. Uh, the same thing happens with Mirai Large Cap. You know, another excellently well-managed fund. And you can see he's more of a GOP style manager. At the same time, what we spoke about the access blue chip, more of a growth style manager, right? So what you can do is actually pad your portfolio with funds of these different styles. Uh, and, uh, you know, that will really help you get diversification, not just on an asset uh, basis or even within small, large and mid, but even within different fund manager styles, it will actually be interesting to kind of look at it from that context. The last bit is obviously, you know, another very interesting, very quick data point that you can refer to is when you're building a portfolio of funds, this is a common holdings report with, between various funds and their strategies. Uh, you know, the lower the number, the better. That means the overlap between the funds is actually limited, and you can get a good sort of, uh, you know, diversification uh, within the context of your portfolio. So I'm going to, uh, you know, in the interest of time, I will end my uh, sort of uh, this thing here, uh, and, you know, I'll, I'll let uh, Kalyan take over the, the Q&A. Hey, thank you, Kostov, for the very, very comprehensive uh, overview on the manager selection process. Uh, very clearly, it is uh, leaving me with the thought uh, that uh, uh, manager selection is indeed an art rather than an exact science. Uh, so we'll try to cover some of those qualitative uh, uh, aspects of uh, uh, manager selection process. But before that, a uh, lot of the things that you have mentioned indeed are kind of uh, a reflection of uh, GIPs. Uh, so how accepted, how important you think when you look at a fund that a, a particular uh, house or a scheme or a fund manager strongly believes in the JIPS framework? Sorry, uh, I, I couldn't hear you clearly. Can you come again, please? Uh, I, uh, is it better now? Are you able to hear me? Yes, yeah, yeah, it is. It is. Okay, I'm saying that most of the things that you mentioned are kind of fall within the larger JIPS framework. Right. So where does that uh, practice uh, or adoption that stands today in the Indian context? So uh, I'll be frank. I, you know, I don't think we've had specific discussions around uh, JIPS framework with managers, but you know, to my understanding, when we talk about it, I think uh, it is still an evolving sort of framework from a manager context. I mean, there are managers who are kind of definitely talking about it, but not completely adopted it to the T. That's I mean, in my because you know we haven't had specific conversations around that, so I can't thumb the table and say that everyone's really moving to that sort of uh, side of the table yet. All right, I'm guessing my voice is good now. Are you able to hear me well? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, see, another question uh, which has come up is about the parentage, right? You have mentioned that during your presentation as well. Right. There is this whole thing. Not there is one thing which I found very interesting uh, in the Indian context, some statistics, that if you look at the larger publicly uh, traded uh, securities and those funds, that is the larger mutual fund, versus let us say an AIF, uh, which is private equity, if you see the success of the platforms, most of the mutual funds come from the large houses. Uh, and the, many of them have little success. And the other way around is also uh, it has not been very easy for the smaller players to go big and become large uh, uh, fund houses to manage mutual funds. Uh, right. That's one statistic from a platform perspective. Second thing is, of course, about the whole star manager, star fund manager concept. So, right. how, how important, where do you give weightage to the individual versus the platform? Yeah. So, you know, just to answer your first question in terms of, uh, so yes, I mean, it has been a pretty uh, I would say, yes, it's been a top heavy industry, so to speak, in that sense, you know, uh, uh, if I remember, I have my data right, the, the top 10 asset managers would account for probably like in excess of 80% of the assets under management, you know, while you have 
another 30, 30, 32 asset managers that exist. Uh, but the good positive sign is that, you know, we are moving away and at least, you know, what I've seen for my career and there's been a sea change is that the guys who've really walked the talk, you know, in terms of, you know, th there are managers who are now more and more openly coming and talking about what their process is, what, you know, how do they really follow it? Uh, you know, what is the investment mandate? They've been more and more open about it, right? So that's, and that's been linked to performance. So that's helping some of the mid-tier guys, you know, actually come up the curve. So obviously there is still a reasonable gap to, from the large guys to where the mid-tier guys, but, you know, slowly, even the industry, you know, be it advisors, the whole distribution fraternity is definitely evolving from purely looking at, uh, you know, just being with big guys, you know, safety numbers to acknowledging that there are merits of looking at some of these, uh, you know, uh, guys who really have good strategies at place and not necessarily large right now, but, you know, could potentially, uh, you know, deliver that kind of uh, performance that you're, you're, you know, the kind of mandate that you need from your portfolio. Uh, if you don't mind, could you just repeat your second part of the question to me? Uh, so I'm saying that, so yeah, actually it is an extension of what you have just said. I'm saying that given this, now, right. this partly to my mind sounds prescriptive, right? It's not, but when you actually go out and recommend, you don't want, you don't recommend a fund necessarily to encourage an upcoming or a budding fund manager. You, 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 you of course, the qualitative uh, weightages that you may give, but right. um, still one has to go through the hygiene quantitatives uh, and pass through them, right? So uh, do they, uh, where, do you, where do you kind of make the difference? Where, where do you draw the line? Yeah. So, uh, you know, the interesting bit is that uh, when you look at, I mean, when we talk about, you know, uh, star managers, so it's not like, you know, it's a big fund house or a big manager. So firstly, in, in terms of our own research, we're completely unbiased in that sense, right? Uh, so. The whole conversations around trying to track the funds that are the most meaningful from an investor's perspective. Obviously, there are challenges in terms of, you know, this is a pretty resource intensive work in terms of the work that we do. So it's not like we can track all, you know, thousand plus schemes that's there. We have to pick and choose the funds. Uh, when we started with the industry, was obviously pick some of the bigger guys because, you know, obviously they had the greater assets to put our views on that. But, you know, the, I, I don't think, you know, while people might still ascribe to the star manager culture, or you might think that it exists. I think that's being done away with and sometimes maybe excessively so, you know. So we spoke about, uh, you know, I gave the example of Prashant's strategy, right? He's always been taken as you know, one of those star managers and he's had a, he's had a significantly difficult time over the last, you know, uh, you know, last five, six years, right? I mean, it's been a market that's been so polarized. He's had significant, in fact, a lot of people have said that has he really lost his mojo. So I don't think that's happened. And, you know, when you actually have a conversation and, you know, some of these elements that I spoke about, it's still, I mean, he's still a great manager, right? But it's not because, you know, he's built his aura around himself, but what he's doing, he's walking the talk. That's, that's something that is important to a certain. And that's what we would really do, uh, you know, through the qualitative framework of assessment. And because, uh, you know, uh, luckily for us, the access to the managers is not hard and we you know, continue to have conversations. We can tap back to conversations we've had with any manager two, three years back and, you know, kind of time to, you know, what they said back then, did that really play out the way uh, in the current context of things, you know, that gives you additional confirmation of conviction that, you know, what they're saying is not purely lip service, but actually something that has, you know, played out. Sure, sure. Uh, so does this uh, also include a special category of fund managers and funds, funds, let us say, for example, a first time fund manager, okay, as in uh, somebody who has kind of taken up the, uh, you know, stewardship role out there right. or, or and, and then is the, is the criteria of evaluation any different when it comes to, let us say, certain category of funds, which are, let's say, highly concentrated funds can be, we saw uh, funds which had only 11 stocks in the past. Right, uh, then, yeah. we had, uh, then we are also talking about small cap funds, right. some special, or maybe some sector thematic funds. So, right. how different is, is the criteria going to be any different when it comes to a broad based fund to a special category fund? Yeah. That, and that, and, you know, I think that's a that's a great question because uh, what happens typically, like when you look at it, uh, obviously the broader construct of the discussion or what you would look at would remain the same, but the contours of the discussion could take various parameters, right? So one is obviously the capacity of, of strategies becomes very important to think about. So when you talk about, uh, you know, either it's a very concentrated strategy, you know, in a very niche segment. So, you know, I gave the example earlier of the IDFC fund. Now, 
use kind of a niche strategy. So the good thing they've done is that they've gated flows, right? And that becomes very important from the fact that you know you don't want to be diluting the investment proposition uh, by you know by, by being completely sales driven and saying, hey, I'm you know because you know the more the assets, the more my my sort of management fees. Uh, you know, rather you're taking a call which is consciously good for the investors that I'm going to gate flows so that I can manage the way I want. I think that's important. The same thing would we typically don't rate sector funds. Uh, you know, I think that's uh, something we you know at least from an Indian context get away from right now. Uh, more diversified, but you know, for something like small caps again, that becomes a very interesting discussion. And we're getting into that realm of things right now in terms of uh, you know, are some of the fund sizes becoming a little large to manage? Because you know, obviously liquidity is a little bit of a challenge on those counters. Uh, you know, fund size has become too large. Uh, it needs to be understood as to how the framework is going to change for the manager. Uh, so those are conversations that we'll have and try to gauge. Those are additional checks of you know things that we try to do, uh, looking at liquidity profile of uh, you know some of these strategies to understand that are they still in the comfortable zone or are they kind of getting into an asset growth mode. Sure, sure. Uh, increasingly, we are seeing some of these trends, let us say, directly investing, no more advisor. Right. 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 And, and that is seeing an increasing trend. ETFs is also right. gaining. Right. In, in your own statistics that you mentioned, if you remove some of those uh, high performing months, periods, so they have largely underperformed the benchmark. Right. Well, I'm assuming for a minute the benchmark is index, of course. Um, and that is one part. Then there are a lot of retail investors. Uh, etc. To these people, how much is agencies like Morningstar an answer uh, or a substitute to the advisors? One. Second, if you can give some performance uh, statistics of yourself as to, for example, how many of your top quartile recommended or rated funds mm -hmm. have actually went ahead and performed well or outperformed right. in the future. So right. how, how, how has your own performance been? Okay, sure, sure. That's, I, I think, a very useful and a great question again. So let me start with uh, the context of the active-passive debate that you alluded to in the first part of your uh, question, right? Uh, now, that's that's a debate that's obviously been raging globally and you know, the data is for all to see that assets would really rule the roost in terms of flows. And you know when you just compare actives say, in, in a market like the US, uh, actors are significantly, a large part of them underperformed their passive peers, right? In India, we don't think we're at that point yet. Uh, there are elements of that happening. Like we saw the more recent, uh, you know, sort of polarized markets where a large part of the active managers underperformed, but that is, like we said, because it is a very small segment of the market that is moving. Uh, but as we move along in time, as the asset, you know, that's being managed by the industry continues to grow, I think it will become uh, increasingly hard for everyone to beat, right? So maybe if you're having this conversation five years back, you'll say that, you know, even, even the most average manager would probably beat the benchmark. Today, when you talk about it, you know, in segments, especially like the large cap, uh, given the constraints that have been put in by the regulator, it will, you know, only the really good guys with very focused mandates will potentially beat the benchmark over a long term. They will, you know, most likely underperform over the short term, right? So that's, I think, important to acknowledge. So we think ETFs are a are a decent sort of play in portfolios, especially for the investors who can't make that investing decision. Because the other thing that happens is choice paralysis in the industry, right? So we spoke about, uh, you know, so many funds. There are a lot of investors just sitting on the sidelines because they don't know what fund to pick or what assets to buy. Uh, you know, an ETF serves that beautiful role that you can get exposure, but really not worrying about manager selection in that sense. Uh, you know, just building that as a core part of your holding, you know, if you, what your asset allocation will. So I mean, I think ETFs will have an increasingly greater role to play going forward. Uh, the only thing that you know, I think we'd want to see from the industry is, is liquidity improve for people to truly buy uh, ETFs you know, over the counter. Uh, because I think currently, that's a little bit of a challenge. You, know, you need to be very cognizant of bid-ask spread on a lot of ETFs. I think that's, that's a little bit of a challenge. But the second part of your question, uh, you know, in terms of how can people use Morningstar uh, and can we do without an advisor, I think for the average investor on the street, an advisor is extremely important. And I can't harp upon more about the fact because it's not only about picking the asset class and, and, and the fund, right? It's about behavioral coaching of investors. And I think that often gets ignored because you know, in times like this, if I'm an investor not guided by an advisor, he might just panic and redeem at 
you know, 30% lower than the market value. And that can be seriously damaging on a long term to your portfolio. You can probably never ever recover from it. That's where an advisor plays a very important role, being a behavioral coach to the investor saying that, look, this has happened before, it'll happen again. But as long as you have your allocations right, you have your time horizon, that's not a problem. You know, so that that's, I think an advisor, you know, uh, direct is obviously a good option for guys who are either DIY, who have the knowledge, you know, can kind of pick funds for themselves, or obviously within, you know, a pure advisory model using direct and charging separate fees, you know, a model that obviously globally is becoming more popular, right? The last bit is something that, uh, and you know, maybe we'll, we can actually uh, talk about that uh, very quickly in terms of, you know, how are our rated funds really done, right? So we've obviously been doing this from a star rating concept, which I said the quantitative and the analyst ratings. And if I look at both rating systems, right? So I spoke about the predictive power of the ratings that we come along with. So the one thing that obviously we've done studies on globally and for India is on, on the star ratings, which is the quant ratings, uh, which get published very widely. Uh, and the best part is that if say five years back, you bought a four or a five star rated fund and you look to the performance today, a four or five star rated on an average would have beaten your one, two, three star. I don't remember the exact outperformance number, but that would have happened. We have separately run this efficacy study uh, you know, for our analyst rated funds, though, you know, the, uh, the vintage of analyst ratings is much more recent, just the last seven, eight years. But again, our gold and silver rated funds on an average have delivered, you know, our performance anywhere between 50 to 100 basis points, you know, in some of the equity categories over, you know, say a, a neutral or a bronze and in some cases even higher. And that's only the average number. So the idea is that it gives you that, you know, sort of perspective that uh, some of these predictive factors do work. Obviously, you know, everyone can go wrong. And there you know, have been times when, you know, we obviously thought that a manager is following a process and doing well, but you know, these are, these are part and parcels and learnings for all of us. But largely, I think this, this context has worked for us both in India and globally, both on both our rating systems. Uh, I think it's been pretty sturdy in that sense. Sure. That also answers a couple of other questions raised by the attendees in terms of the role of the goal planning, which is right. again, largely what an advisor would play. And I don't think right. as Morningstar, you would be continue to be specialized in uh, uh, manager selection process. Um, the, the other part is, see, you are seeing a, a different form of uh, uh, funds coming up. Let, us, let me put it that way. Let's say PMS or which are now largely coming as AF category three uh, in, in the form of that right. for very, very technical reasons. Um, do you also track that? Uh, so actually, no, uh, as of now, no, uh, because the biggest problem and the biggest challenge for us, and like I, you know, when I, when I shared through my presentation, data is a very, very large or a big enabler for us in terms of that. And we need reliable, consistent data for us to do all the analysis, uh, rather than just, you know, go, like I said, uh, from lip service from the manager and believing what they say. Right. And the biggest challenge is publicly available data. While a few of them might want to share information with us. Uh, but you know, if you want to do that, you want to have it for a broader set of managers rather than just sticking to the ones who are, you know, kind of approach you to do it. Because like I said, we are unbiased researchers. So we don't want people to come and say, Hey, can you rate us? Or can you, can you, you know, cover us? The idea is that we identify guys and do it. So unless we have the comfort that, you know, there is a point where say the PMS guys will have one standard performance reporting metric, you know, or even a standard uh, a metric in terms of how do they share portfolios. And that's something we've been having conversations with, but we haven't gotten to a common ground as yet. But we hopefully maybe, you know, somewhere in the roads down the line, we could start that at least with uh, some of the PMS sort of uh, solutions. Yeah, because, because, because as we're seeing more and more from, I mean, really the star managers are taking that yes. route in terms of, uh, and, and that's an important, uh, uh, important uh, you know, security one is looking at. Uh, we will. Uh, so before we move to some of the, uh, we we'll take a deeper dive into qualitative aspects. A uh, lot of questions around where one can find all these data, be it an advisor station of uh, advisor workstation of Morningstar, or where all these charts can be found uh, on the Morningstar. Uh, can you quickly? Uh, yeah, sure. So, so a lot of the yeah, so a lot of the basic data is actually available on our website. So you know, I spoke about. Uh, the growth charts and some of these interesting data points. Our star ratings are available on our website uh, if you want to use that as a short listing tool, like I mentioned. Uh, and beyond that, obviously, a lot of this gets populated into, we have two research platforms. One is the advisor workstation, which is used more by independent financial advisors who can do a lot of uh, 
uh, you know, portfolio work, uh, prospecting work, and also access a lot of these charts and data to, to build portfolios for their clients. And then there's another platform, which is more of an institutional research platform, which in fact our own in-house analysts use to, to track funds, which is Morningstar Direct, which actually is like the mothership of everything. Because, you know, in Morningstar, we're very, very firm believers of that a chart, you know, a picture says a thousand words, right? So uh, we've built some incredible, incredible charting capabilities. I showed you a few of them in the presentation, but there's just so much more that you can do that you don't need to pour over reams and heaps of data. You can see that through one quick chart and actually start forming, you know, your views and opinions pretty quickly. So these are the basic three broad, uh, because, you know, we want a lot of the information to be there on our website. So even, uh, you know, individuals can go and kind of take a look at it. So, so one can access them uh, through, uh, you know, do they have to subscribe to it? Do they have to? Uh, no. So you, you obviously would need to sign up on the website, but that's free. I mean, you would, you would get access to the full information. Sure, sure, sure. Great. So one, one, one another question about Morningstar and uh, so you are in a way independent, as you mentioned, right? How do you maintain your conflict of interest? And where do you make your, what are your sources of revenue? Uh, if the second part, you can choose to skip, but how do you maintain conflict of uh, yeah, so that's and you know that's a, that's a question we get asked often. So, and you know we speak about Chinese words, but here it's a very clear and like I said, right. So when we come from manager research team, uh, the team that I had in India, uh, the mandate for choosing funds. So uh, you know it's, it's a very clear definition and line that you know we will not be conversing with uh, you know the sales guys or with the asset managers to to pick and choose funds. That mandate purely lies a with us and b any ratings that we push forward. And you know, I think that's a very important thing gets discussed at various levels. So as an analyst, if I were to cover a fund, you know, first the choice of covering or not covering a fund purely lies with the manager research team and it's not driven. So in fact, some of our strategies that we cover, you know, we don't have any business relationships with the asset managers at all. You know, that's, that's, that's been the case. And, you know, we, we stick by that independence. Uh, and, you know, that's something which has been done globally. And in terms of just the process, right? Like I said, so in terms of identifying strategies, it's a discussion that we would have locally in terms of picking what we believe are, are, are the great strategies that we want to cover. B, when there's a rating that's assigned to a strategy, it actually goes through multiple levels of discussion. It's not like an analyst can just decide to cover a strategy and, and put his views on it and, and, and write a report. Uh, it obviously gets discussed with the local ratings committee. Uh, and then that actually is sent to a regional ratings committee, which obviously sits out of our uh, you know, we report into the Australia team at the Sydney office. So there are multiple rounds that happens, uh, you know, in terms of to maintain our independence and uh, sort of an unbiasedness in that sense to, to ensure that you know, what we're putting out and that's what we've always stood for is investors first. That's been our motto and you'd see a lot of our research sticks with that. So we've had hard conversations with managers, uh, you know, whom we've not rated highly and obviously everyone wants to be rated the best. Uh, so that's something you know, I share that uh, you know, uh, this is what we think about you and we've, we've not been afraid to write about that. If we see there's something wrong, we would, we, as Morningstar, we will not, uh, you know, uh, not step back from thinking or writing about that. Sure, sure. I'm sure. And then, of course, uh, some of uh, your practices have really grown your subsector of the industry as well and given a lot of inspiration to others. I'm sure you maintain a lot of them. But now let's move from the conflict of interest internally to uh, let's move to the fund managers, right? right? So how do you look at some of those aspects, right? So for example, the qualitative aspects when you look at a fund manager, it can be compensation, which is linked to performance. It can be carry structure. It can be how big is the team, how long the team has been with the fund, how big the team is, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, right. Can you touch upon some of those uh, qualitative aspects when you look at a team? Yeah, sure, sure. Or individual. So yeah, yeah. So, so, you know, typically what we do, right? So when we're looking at uh, the conversation, so when we're trying to meet, say, a new manager, right? So uh, obviously there are managers who we've already kind of been interacting with for years and we formed opinions, but say there's a new manager. The first line of work that we would do from an, from an analyst perspective is that actually either he's new to the fund house or it's, you know, he's been working the fund house, he's been managing public money for a while. We have access to all the data to understand really form an opinion on what his broader construct of the style or the way he's been managing a strategy. So we get a basic opinion, you know, which is already kind of, you know, I wouldn't say form an opinion, but at least have some gunpowder and understanding in terms of the way a manager's style, does he have a particular 
style that he follows or a particular segment of the market that he you know he operates in large mid small and he's built his style and then obviously the way we would do it is interact after that have an interaction with the fund manager you know so the way any conversation would go is to let him speak talk about his investment process and ask very pointed questions about okay you know back to all the data that we have that you know okay, you said you were a buy and hold manager but hey you know this is this list of 10 stocks uh you know which which is kind of you know moved in and out of your portfolio so what's happening so that you know do that second level of understanding that you know why that's happened think of his thought process get a good understanding of that you also spend time with the research analysts uh you know say be it equity or fixed income analysts to to get ask them a similar set of questions to see that are we getting a resonating view across the board or not so you know when you do these multiple rounds of conversations you can build an opinion about you know is it truly being followed to a sense or is that something that's you know been put in in words but it's not actually being followed in in spirit you know the other thing is obviously uh compensation and that's a very interesting point that you raised uh that's something that we look at from the stewardship aspect now the regulators made a rupee amount uh you know which gets published for managers available on websites you know in the last couple of years but we've actually been having these conversations with managers for a very long time and we don't really care about the final rupee amount of you know someone's getting an x amount of crores or whatever the important part is to how is this performance linked to the performance uh, you know how is this variable pay linked to the performance of the strategy and you know as we've been kind of evolving over time in our discussions with the managers the one thing which we've seen happen is a lot of them are actually streamlined now obviously a lot of these are you know they're not public conversations uh, but the one thing that we've seen is that they started moving away from short term performance linking to longer term performance linking where uh, you know they've uh, spoken about okay that you know an equity manager even if i underperform for one year that's okay and you know i look at how you do versus the peer group on a 3 5 year basis because finding investor money is coming in for that longer term so if you link it to that sort of context the manager is not trying to maximize his returns through his variable pay by chasing short term performance this is the last thing you want to do i think that's the more useful context in terms of you know actually we would love it if the regulator stepped in and said you know can you make that sort of information public like you know how are you linking variable pays uh, rather than because a, a rupee amount is actually meaningless in a sense without letting you know how it is derived and globally that's how it happens where you know people put down contours of how the variable pays is 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 a manager compensation is decided rather than purely just a rupee number or a dollar number for that matter sure sure absolutely um now now we will move to uh, the distribution the whole the whole distribution setup right 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 now, uh, i mean one of i i think i think uh, uh, the regulator has come down quite heavily beyond a point of uh, amusement uh, on on the whole fees and direct and it is it is reshuffled the way distribution is happening today compared with let's say 10 years back um but from your experience mm -hmm. today what percentage of the uh, decision making process is still driven by commissions one make uh, so so touch upon please commissions part of uh, the whole thing uh, from a practitioner's perspective i'm talking about uh, yeah, sure. but, but before that uh, if you can also tell us a bit about the expense i'm just clubbing these two from a uh, financials point of view while they're two conceptually different things expense part the fund managers how much are they uh, transparent in terms of explaining the expenses uh, part to the uh, to the investors and then when it translates to commissions there is a tangential uh, relevance there because uh, how much of those commissions get factored in back into the expenses etc can you touch upon those aspects yeah sure sure and i, I think these are very important conversations to have right now because the regulator obviously has been doing a lot of activity around this and they've they've actually moved quite significantly over the last year or two right so maybe before i answer that i just highlight some of the things that the regulator has, has done for the interest of the audience so clearly one thing that they've done is they've rationalized the expense ratios uh, the slabs as they call them right because uh, they had slabs that were from a very very old period of time where you know the fund sizes were a lot smaller and uh, now that the industry has grown they've rationalized that by by bringing down the expense ratio slabs uh to make it more meaningful and as the fund size grows the expense ratio automatically sort of comes down which is great because it's kind of building in that economies of scale with the structure so as we continue to grow 
the expenses will come down because obviously you know there is an economies of scale that can be built in into some of the functions that that are carried out right uh the other thing that regulators done and you know which probably takes away a large part of the conflict of interest of distributors is 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 doing away with upfront commissions so they've already been trying to cap upfront commissions and and, and make some other tweaks but uh you know through 2018 uh, late 2018 19 they've, they've done away with uh, upfront commissions altogether so it's only trailer commissions that get paid so in that sense now it's become more streamlined that 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 potential for conflict of interest has been reduced significantly from a distribution sort of standpoint because you know you, you you're not making you know a buck for every 100 rupees that you sell uh, on day one when you uh, kind of make that investment so i think we are seeing that you know because of the regulatory driven changes that mindset in a way is kind of moving away there were a lot of people who were still uh, you know looking to move towards uh, trailer commissions which is a good sign uh, you know especially in the independent financial advisory space uh, i think that's happening the other thing that is uh, probably the next crux of is, is the ri versus distributor model right uh, you know do you do you pay for advice or do you get commissions embedded in in the fund fees now globally what we've been seeing happening and you know monistar we've obviously written a lot of reports about it, is that the model is moving away from commission driven sales you know that commissions embedded into fund fee structures to paying separately for advice uh in a market like india i think it's slightly different because we're still way behind the curve in terms of financial literacy uh so we might still be and, and obviously the regulator is cognizant of that uh that uh, you know while expenses might be potentially still higher uh from a global context but you know we need to still build up build scale get distribution in place to reach we we still you know the top 20 30 cities really accounts for the large part of the area right how do you get to the grassroots the smaller towns the smaller cities uh so that's probably a little bit of a, uh you know balancing that you know both the regulator and the industry participants need to do uh so that's broader in terms of just the way the construction of the industry or the distribution practices but like i said some of these moves from the regulator are kind of future proofing us quite well because you know today we have funds uh, in excess of say 15 20 30 thousand crores in size when that grows to 50 000 1 lakh crores uh the expense ratios on those funds are going to come down because you know if you 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 add 50 bucks 50 paise back to the uh, from the expense to the fund uh you know the alpha generation for an active fund can become quite significant right uh you know because if you're on an average generating just 100 basis points in alpha 50 basis points can make a significant difference like i said that alpha generation capability is still there uh, but as that starts narrowing even expenses uh, you know that needle will will probably move even further as the assets grow and uh, obviously the alpha generation starts coming up sure i mean talking to you seems to be kind of never any it's a floodgate uh, you found a net of knowledge and information so but 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 we are constrained by time uh, i would like to ask one last question about how do you see the future obviously uh, uh, agencies like that of yours have added significant value to the ecosystem um, i mean i'm just wondering to a point that for example if you look at a wealth managers profession it's always i mean we have you've seen the importance of goal planning behavioral counseling so on and so forth right uh, large right. relationship driven uh, right are you seeing that the, the manager selection now i i am starting to wonder with the excellent work that you guys are delivering is the manager selection still a core function of a wealth advisor or is it already becoming uh, outsourced to people like you in other words they may not completely outsource it but are the team sizes coming down uh, right understand more of the client side and so how is the future going to be yeah, like absolutely yeah. sorry carry yeah, on go ahead yeah no so I, i think that's a very interesting question and that's a trend that we you know we've been having multiple conversations with obviously uh you know distributors wealth managers and and that's clearly something that you know which is very important because you know when we talk about core competence right i mean the whole point of investing in a mutual fund is that that's that's not an investor's core competence in picking stocks you give the job to a professional manager who does that in a similar fashion and you know those are the conversations that we've been having with multiple uh, sort of you know people that we talk to that like you rightly said you know you build a set of allocation models you do the behavioral coaching you own the relationship but is this necessarily obviously you would still want to own the overall piece but the elements can come from someone whose core competence is actually doing that right 
And that's actually, you know, we've been having so many conversations exactly around that. And we've been seeing a lot of interest around, because, you know, qualitative research in that sense, uh, because, you know, as a country, uh, I mean, we're still evolving in terms of investor behavior, advisor behaviors that, like I said, it's largely been performance driven, but no one's really talked about it from the context of how do you slice and dice that performance to understand that does it really work? Is it just, is it just pure luck or is it skill? And, you know, that's where we're bringing that awareness and the value to the table. And, 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 you know, I think that's the, that's the part that the way it's going to evolve where, you know, these sort of functions get uh, decentralized into uh, sort of people who are experts at doing that rather than, uh, you know, sticking with, uh, uh, you know, sort of in silos within an organization. Sure. Sure. Thank you so much, Kostub. Uh, it's been wonderful conversing with you. Uh, if you have any uh, closing remarks to make, uh, we'd like to hear from you. Yeah, so, uh, thanks, thanks, Kalil. I think a uh, you know wonderful session, and thank you so much to all the attendees. Uh, I think just just a few words I leave with that. Uh, you know, focus on allocation, asset allocation, fund selection should remain the core. Be it for an advisor, be it for an investor yourself. Uh, you need to stay the path. As long as you've you've done the hard work at the start of building a portfolio, uh, you should have much lesser behavioral shocks as you go along the journey. Uh, so that's that's pretty much uh, you know my closing remarks. And thank you so much for being a patient audience. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy. Uh, thanks for your time. Thank you, thank you all. As you know, there is a survey which you can take after this uh, session is over. Uh, thank you, Kostov. Thanks again and. Uh, these weekends are very different, but I still wish you all a, a very happy weekend and uh, thank you very much. Thank you.